Let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. So we're continuing in the theme of Ezekiel chapter 1. The fiery chariot throne of the Lord and the, and the fiery throne guardians. That's the cherubim. The fiery throne guardians. And the four faces of the throne guardians. And it's the face of the lion, the face of the ox, the face of the man, and the face of the eagle. Also, it's in Revelation chapter 4 and Ezekiel chapter 10. And uh, that these fiery throne guardians, that, that they are guardians of God's fiery throne, they, they are... Representing God, so the four faces of the cherubim are the four faces of God, and they represent uh, God's character and nature and attributes. And so these cherubim that are God, guarding God's throne, but God Himself on the throne, not that God needs a guard, but He allows us to be involved anyway. But they are the servants of the Lord and they are an example of the servants of the Lord because we're called to be fiery throne guardians of the fiery throne. Just like the Levites in the Old Testament, they would carry on their shoulder the Ark of the Covenant that represents the throne of God with the cherubim. And we are the Melchizedek priesthood and we don't carry a box around Brisbane. But we are... The temple. We have within us the fiery throne. We have within us the burning one of heaven. And we're going to guard that throne. Guard your hearts. You guard the throne of God on your heart. And that we are called to be burning ones like the seraphim and the cherubim. And the seraphim, they're the golden altar guardians, and the cherubim are the golden throne. Fiery throne guardians. And so we're looking at this theme. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is the fullness of the image of God. Therefore, he is in perfection, the image reflector of God. Therefore, he is in perfection, revealing the four faces of God. And we are called and predestined to become like him. The ultimate goal of the Christian life is to become one with Christ, to become like Christ, so we become one with the Father as Jesus is one with the Father and we become like Him. Yes. Not that we ever become God, but we become God-like in our character, our nature and our attributes. Yes. And so that's what we're looking at in this study. Um, this morning we're going to look at the face of the ox. And I've got a lot of teaching on this. We'll be looking at this at Wednesday as well and uh, next Saturday, I'm doing a three-hour teaching in the, in the Sunshine Coast of the whole thing of the face of the lion and the face of the ox and how they interact. And um, it's a very, very powerful subject. So at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops or a mighty harvest comes from the strength of an ox. If we want to see kingdom harvest in our lives, if we want to see the kingdom harvest in our marriage, in our family, in our community here at Lions Roar and in, in the community out of Lions Roar, if we want to see a harvest of heaven, we have to have the strength of an ox. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning, next Wednesday, and next Sunday. Um, the, the Bible says a lot on this theme. And so that's the thing. is That's talking about fruitfulness of the kingdom. Mm. And there's a mighty harvest when you have the strength of the ox. So the strength of the lion that we looked at previously is in warfare. Yeah. It's in its, its, its bold aggression. To come against the, the enemy's kingdom, to destroy strongholds, bind up strong men, and to take territory from the enemy. It's a kingly anointing. It's about the kingdom authority of the king, the line of the tribe of Judah. It's boldness and courage and aggression and holy violence. 
Not as unsanctified violence, which is destruction, but a holy violence, which is destruction to the powers of darkness that sets the captives free. That's the boldness or the, the, the strength of the lion is found in those characteristics. And, the, and, and, the, and God is a lion and Jesus is the lion of Judah and you're called to be lions. Mm-hmm. We're called to be a lion-like people. Okay? Um, but God is also the ox. And I'll, I'll be really honest with you, as I study through the, the four faces, I get very excited about the face of the lion. I want to be a lion. In fact, when I do the character, my wife and I, we did the personality test and we're lions, right? So we almost killed each other, but um, finally, finally worked out how not to kill each other and how to actually unify and focus our aggression on the enemy instead of on each other. And we had a prophetic word prophesied over us when we first got married, you know, do, doing the post-marriage counselling. And we did this personality test. We both come up lions and the pastor was looking at us going, oh, my goodness. Says so you guys are either going to kill each other, because in, in nature two strong lions don't hang out together. You always got to have the alpha that controls. He said you either kill each other, or you learn how to come in submission to the line of the tribe of Judah, Amen. and you learn how to stand together in unity. And then you are going to be the devil's nightmare. You're going to cause great destruction to the powers of darkness. Okay, so that's a prophetic promise with a challenge, isn't it? Um, so the face of the lion is very exciting to me. The face of the eagle, the prophetic. Yeah. Okay, and that's the strength of the eagle is that it can arise above adversity. Mm-hmm. And it goes to the high places and it can see as God sees the big picture of things. It sees a God perspective. It's the prophetic seer, the eagle. It overcomes by arising. In fact, the, the adversity... For an eagle, the, the storm and the updrafts of storms and, and hot weather, it catches the updraft and because of the storm, it's able to go higher. Yes. Yes. And, and, and so that's the nature of the eagle that we're going to look at in a, a future lesson. But the, you know, the attack of the enemy, you take advantage of it and it causes you to press in deeper to God. Yes. It causes you to go higher into the place of revelation. The devil actually causes you to get closer to God. His plan is he wants, to, he wants you to give up and pull away. It's your choice. That's it. You can be destroyed by the storm or you can overcome it and enter the high places. Okay, that's the face of the eagle. And so I get excited, the eagle. You can tell I'm really excited at the moment talking about <laughs> lions and eagles. It's been prophesied over me that in lions rule that we have the face of the lion and the face of the eagle as a ministry. Okay? The face of the man, well, anyway, if I can't be a lion or an eagle, at least I'm a man, you know, like a... <laughs> But have you ever seen the face of an ox? Like, seriously. It is like the least attractive of the four faces of God, right? Yet in Ezekiel 10, it says the face of the ox is the face of the cherubim. Their primary face is the ox. Because Jesus says the first is last, the last is first. And we all want to be the lion. And we don't want to be the ox, but the last is first. And so we're going to look at this because actually, I believe the face of the ox is a key that connects everything. Mm. And uh, let's look back at the scripture. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. And it's interesting because baby Jesus was put in a manger, wasn't he? I bet they had to clean it. And it's amazing the things of God that get you know come into mangers. But the idea being, the ox is speaking of, of hard work. Yeah. And they use the oxen, they yoke the oxen together to plow up the ground. And you do hard work for the harvest. If you don't do the hard work, you're not going to see a harvest, right? Yeah. But when you've got lots of oxen and they come into the the stalls and you've got to put all the food into the manger and they come into the stalls and they, they plod in with all of the dirt and the mud and, the, and there's ox poop everywhere. <laughs> and things get messy. Yeah. The work of the kingdom, when you personally start to say, I want to see harvest in my life, I want to see harvest in my marriage, I want to see harvest in Lion's Royal House of Prayer, 
I don't want to be a spectator that just attends on Sunday morning. I want to actually build what God is building. We looked at that last week. Jesus is building a people that overcome the gates of Hades. Ecclesia, a people with kingdom governmental authority. Amen. And we build with Jesus. The Lord is looking for people that will help him build what he's building, and that's work. That's it. Yeah. It's hard work. And when you, if, if you've ever worked on teams, we all like to be lone rangers because, you know, the, the only person we really have problems with is ourselves. <laughs> and, and some of us have big problems with that person. Yeah. But when you work on teams, it actually exposes the weaknesses in your life. That's right. Um, you know, you, as iron sharpens iron, so is one that sharpens the countenance of their friends. And that's like marriage, you know. As you rub up against one another and all this stuff happens. And what happens is life gets busy. Relationships and the closer, especially covenant relationships, which is marriage. For those that are in the internship, you actually, in Lions World, we have a, an agreement or a vow that you make in regards to your commitment to Lions Roar and helping us build this house. And you join a team, and the worship team people know this as well. When you get into teams that are committed... It's like a covenant, and things can get messy. You have personality clashes. Yeah. You have differences of opinions. And, and, and those that pressure can expose in you your weaknesses. Yeah. It gets messy. Mm. But where there's no work of the kingdom happening, it can be very clean and ordered. That's right, yeah. The problem is, it's the peace and the order of a cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> you can have the life that's like a cemetery. It's, all, it's dead. It's not alive. You that's know? It. That's it. Or the, the oxen that are going back and forth and bumping up against each other. And they're making a mess that you've got to clean up. But hey, something is happening. That's yeah. it. You've heard me, um, those Lions Roar that have been here for some time, you would have heard me say this many times, but it's a word that was spoken to me as a young uh, believer. I'd started missions on the mission field in Tibet. And this leader said this thing, because I'd been through some messy, messy relationships, some hurtful relationships, a lot of clashing, iron sharpening iron. To get sharp, there's got to be a clashing going on. And uh, the word was this, show me a Christian that has never made any major mistakes in their Christian life. I'll show you someone that's done absolutely nothing of significance for God in that person. Mm, yeah, yeah. So here is a prophetic word. If you want to press into the kingdom and you want to see harvest, I prophesy you will fail. You will make mistakes. Yeah. You'll, you'll come to see how unchristlike you are. Oh, Praise God. Yeah. Because you're not Christ-like now, but, you know, when you're all by yourself, you think you are. Yes. <laughs> when I was a single young man, I thought I was selfless. And then on a daily basis after marriage, I'm reminded, you're so selfish. <laughs> oh, Chris is real. <laughs> <laughs> This is where, the interesting thing about the ox is this. The eagle is just flying around the heavens, right? This is, <laughs> this is the church is full of those prophetic people. You know them? Yeah. The head is up in the clouds. <laughs> they're so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. It's like, hello, earth calling. Reality calling. That's it, yeah. Oh, I had another vision. I went to another prophetic conference. Oh, I can't wait for more worship. And all that's important. Because you don't want to be, you know, they're so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. But you don't want to be so earthly minded, you're of no heavenly good. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You need a heavenly vision. You need to see things as God sees things. You need to hear the word of the Lord. That's the problem with an ox that's not prophetic. Because all the faces need to interact. Because the ox is very grounded in the earth. They work in the earth. They do the hard work. They've got their face into the now work that needs to happen. They're very practical. 
the eagle is, is very spiritual. But the problem is if the eagle never lands, it doesn't get its prey. That's, That's when the eagle becomes a lion. Got to land and get its prey. It's, and, the, and, and so the, the heavenly vision to become the earthly reality, you're going to have to learn to be ox-like. And this is why there's so many people in the church, and I tell you what, I've been a major part of the prophetic movement, and I move amongst a lot of prophets and, and teaching the prophetic, and I know a lot of these people. And some of them are really seeing the kingdom get established in the earth. The kingdom only gets established when the eagles learn how to be ox-like and build. Because otherwise, it is just fluff and talk. And they're walking around with all these amazing visions and everything, but they're not doing anything about it. Yeah. That's why every, every vision of the Lord is, is an invitation. Every promise of the Lord, every prophetic word is an invitation for intercession. It's also an, in, an invitation for action. Yeah. Okay? And I want Lions for a House of Prayer to be balanced with all four faces. Yeah. I'm excited about the face of the lion and the eagle that we carry as a community. That I carry, but we need to get that ox likeness. And we, we, we say the rubber hits the road. You know, you yeah. talk about it, you talk about it. We've got to actually do. Yeah. Be, be doers of the word, not just hearers who deceive themselves. And that's a large part of the prophetic people in the church. That's it, yeah. They're hearers that deceive themselves, they're seers that deceive themselves because they're not learning about I need to do this. I need to apply this. I need to do something about this word. Yeah. Okay? And that's where it gets messy. And the fear of failure will cause you to pull back from that. Mm. Can, I, can I encourage you embrace the fear of failure? Amen. Mm. Embrace it and overcome it. Amen. Yeah. Defeat it. Amen. Yes. And turn your fear into faith. And say, I'm not going to let the fear of failure stop me from pressing in. But I'm going to allow failure in life to be a lesson that leads to wisdom. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. And then I can counsel other people. That's right. Okay. And so it's not wrong to make mistakes in the Christian life. Mm. As long as you learn by them. Yeah. And the more that you actually step out by faith in God... I guarantee you will make mistakes. That's right, yeah. So they say the first mistake, you know, to, to, to err is human. The second mistake, to err is human. The third mistake, we'll just call you stupid. Because <laughs> you need to learn. That's yeah. it. Okay, if you make the same mistake and this is like five times later, six times later, you're still doing the same mistake over and over again, and you're not learning. Okay, so anyway. So this is, this is, when we look at these faces, I'm going around biblically a lot of concepts it's by the strength of the ox we see the mighty harvest. So the characteristics, the nature of the ox is seen in Scripture. I'm going to go with a bit of an overview right now before we actually start to get a lot of Scripture. And, and that's why I'm spending today and Wednesday and next Sunday. We're going to really spend some time in this, going to soak in the Word until we become one with the Word. Amen? Amen. Okay. Because, you know, you don't want to be that person that sees yourself in the mirror and walks away forgets. And uh, we had the prophetic word from Habakkuk this morning, write down the vision. So that's why I really get excited when I see people with um, a notepad and writing down what I'm saying. Because I know you can take that home, you can look at it, and you can run with it. Because the majority of Christians go to church go, wow, that was an awesome message today. I was really inspired by God. Okay, what did the pastor say? Can't remember, but it was really inspiring. I really enjoyed it when he was speaking. It sounded funny, and then I forgot. Because when you write it down, you can run with it. Mm. And that's the ox. Okay? Not just a hearer, I'm planning to do. Okay, so... And, and ox, there's, there's a number of different words used in the Old Testament, uh, in the Hebrew, and also the New Testament in the Greek. And I'll just explain this. Um, there, there is ox, there is cattle... There is bull, and there's a thing called the wild ox. 
Okay, the wild ox, that's a very bad English translation of Hebrew. We will look a little bit at the wild ox in a different lesson. Uh, the wild ox is actually wild bull because you don't get wild ox. Okay, because an ox is a domesticated beast that is being castrated and that doesn't happen naturally. You know, like the bull up in the mountains, it's all wild and you know, it's like, oh my goodness, I castrated myself. <laughs> Okay, I've thrown out some things like seriously. If you remember anything, remember that. So, the just to let you know, what's called the wild ox. When we study that, uh, it's Raim in the Hebrew. It's the name of an extinct type of wild beast. Um, we have. Obviously, you'll probably find its DNA in all sort of cattle everywhere, but it's extinct now, and they're called the aurochs. And the aurochs were huge, huge uh, wild cattle, and then the male ones, the bulls, um, a normal cow, you know, if it was like this big, they're like twice that size, and they're very hairy, and they have huge horns, and they're very aggressive and very dangerous. Okay, and Israel, God through Balaam prophesies Israel is like that. And they're very, that's when you get the ox married to the lion, and we'll look at that in a different scripture. Look at the, the, map, the, the ox with the eagle, the ox with the lion, these faces connect. So aurochs are huge. Um, so you don't get in nature an oxen. An oxen has been castrated because it's a male, and when the bull is not castrated, and you talk to farmers, and when I was in Toowoomba doing a seminar last month, there's a farmer there, and, and she said, yeah, you cannot even put a domesticated bull in the same um, area as the normal cattle, because the domesticated bull will be running around goring all of the other males, and it'll be trying to make babies with all the females, okay? Because it's, it's driven by its testosterone. Now... The bull is a symbol, and we've got scriptures on this that I'll look at through the teaching, but the bull is a symbol of the uncrucified flesh. So you know the, the, the picture of circumcision where you cut off the flesh for the males? Okay? You've got to cut off the flesh for the males in circumcision. And so castration is a picture of, of like circumcision that you're cutting off the flesh life. Flesh is the, the me, myself, self-centered lifestyle. My fleshly desires guide me. My fleshly passions lead me. You've got to cut that off and sanctify yourself because the oxen can submit. They get yoked and they get submitted to the master. A wild bull won't submit. It says that even in the book of Job. These wild bulls will not, they will not submit to the word of the master. You can't yoke them. You can't use them to plow a field because they are self-willed and self-determined. Okay? Now that is the antichrist picture of the wild bull. There is actually a Christ-like picture of the wild bull that I'll go into in a future lesson. Okay? But this is what we're talking about. The difference between... The face of the ox, the ox-like nature, which has been castrated, you cut off the self-will, the self-determination. It's not about me, myself, and I. It's about Jesus, 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 and the Father, and, and doing what Jesus says, and then love the Father and love others. And it's about the kingdom. It's not about me building my own house. It's not about me making my own name great. Make God's name great. Make the name of Jesus great. And I guarantee from Scripture, you'll be blessed the Lord says, I will make him famous in all the earth, Abraham and his seed. The fame of the Lord comes as you make the Lord famous in your life. Okay? That's why you find your life when you lose it. And that's the picture of the ox. It's, it's a picture of sacrificial lifestyle. They used the oxen for sacrifice. And if ever they did sacrifice a bull, the bull had to be sacrificed. The bull has to be put to death in order for it to be a sanctified offering to the Lord. So whether it's an ox or a bull, it has to be sacrificed. 
And so that picture of if our lives are to really see kingdom harvest, there has to be a cutting off of the flesh, self-determination. This whole thing about me living for me, my plan, my vision. God's not interested in your vision. Right. And he's not even interested in blessing your vision. That's there you go. Right. Yeah. You won't hear that in a lot of churches. You, oh, you know, God's going to bless your vision. Lift it up before the Lord. God doesn't care about your vision. Yeah. I was on the mission field, you know, and, and working amongst Tibetans. And I was constantly, I had this list. Has any of you guys got a list? <laughs> You know, who you want to marry? <laughs> then you wonder why you're never getting married. You know, and I had a list. I had this. I had. I had several lists. <laughs> and, and and I would be very spiritually disciplined to pray over my list to see my list fulfilled. And one day, I was in this place because I was getting very frustrated because uh, uh, certain things. By the way, certain things of the desires of your heart are God's desires. Amazingly. And there's like an agreement, okay, that's good. So some, some things on my list were getting fulfilled because it was in agreement with God's will for my life and God's plan for my life. But there's this other thing, I was just getting frustrated because of am praying and pressing in, it's just not happening. And I'm waiting, right God, what's going on? You know when you get frustrated at God? Have any of you ever been frustrated at God? That's the bull. You just, you know, it's a lot of bull. You've got to castrate that bull. I'm getting frustrated. And so the old flesh life rises up, that old wild bull. And then the Lord says, Glenn, throw away your list. Get a blank sheet of paper and a pen. Wait on me. And I'll give you my will for your life. I'll give you my plan. And you pray into that for fulfillment. And I'll say yes and amen to you. When you get God saying yes and amen to your prayers, you know you're on track, right? Mm. Instead of the Lord saying, depart from me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so don't let him say depart from you to you. That just let your list depart from him. <laughs> so this is the, the, the picture of the, the, the ox is the one that self-discipline, but ultimately it's actually us having discipline over our flesh life as we submit to the voice and the leading of our master. Mm -hmm. Just like the oxen get yoked together and then the, the farmer will guide and direct them so that they stay in their field. There's another word there about the oxen. Because your harvest will be in your field. Yes. And what happens is there's a lot of tumbleweed Christians. <laughs> Have you ever seen in those American cowboy movies a tumbleweed? They're ugly. Like they're just like this ugly looking bush thing with no roots. And, and it just, the wind is blowing and they look like dead things. Yeah. And they're just kind of tumbling through the wilderness and they tumble through the ghost towns in America. Okay, that's a tumbleweed. And if someone prophesied, oh, when I see you, you look just like a tumbleweed, you know. That would not be something that you get excited about. The vision for my life is I want to look like that tumbleweed. No, it it, you just don't have that. It says that the oak has been planted by the waters. Yes, yes. And oaks are strong and they're magnificent and they're glorious. Do you want to be an oak? Or a tumbleweed. You know, apple trees. If you uproot an apple tree, everything dies. Mm, and you've got to know the field into which God has called you, into which God has planted you. And it's okay. So I've said before, you know, when we get visitors to Lions Rule, we want to have hospitality. And um, you always have visitors. Visitors visit our home and they get a meal. Then there's about the people that habitate. It's your home. And the ones that make it their home are the ones that build, that we want to yeah, build. Yeah. Remember, this year is the year of, of God building and establishing his house. Yeah. And it's sons that are building and establish the house. And this, this prophetic word. Well, the thing about the, the strength of the ox 
It follows the voice of the master and it knows the field into which it's called. And it doesn't, it's not like the wild bull, especially the undomesticated one. This is the domesticated bull. He's kind of running around his fenced in field, you know. And, um, but the wild, wild bull, they're up in the mountains and they're just running around. They're self willed, self determined. They're going wherever they want. It's like the Christian that goes to a different church every Sunday. And they wonder why there's no great change and transformation and there's no great harvest in their life. But they're just wandering around from church to church. It's like those prophetic people that wander around from prophetic conference to prophetic conference. And then it just becomes another pathetic conference. But when you know the voice of the Father, the voice says, this is the family. Scripture says in Psalms, he places the lonely into families. And there's something of a spiritual loneliness where there's not a harvest and fruitfulness in people's lives is because they wander around all over the place and never get their roots into relationships. Because your relationship, you can't divorce first commandment from second commandment. You know, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. It's like saying, I love my wife, hate her body. My wife's got a great head. Her head looks beautiful. I'll just cut off the rest of it. You know, but when I fall in love with my wife and we got married, the reason we got babies is because I loved her whole body. Yes. Okay, I'm speaking spiritual things, so those of you who are mature won't get offended. If I only love her head, there's no babies. Mm. It's the same in the body of Christ. You have to engage and commit into the body Amen. and have covenant relationship with the body, otherwise there is no harvest. That's it. Yeah. And it will get messy and there'll be hard work. You've got to work through relationships. Amen. That's it. And everyone that, of you that is married or has been married, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. <laughs> Talk about sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You know, marriage is God's great sanctifier. It will bring you to the cross and it will kill you. Yes. So all of you singles that have this romantic, you know, <laughs> eagle, heavenly minded, you know, it's, it's all going to be good. I'll get married and I'll found my best friend and, you know, I'll be encouraged always and, you know, never feel lonely ever again. I, I, sometimes marriage is, some of my loneliest times of life has been through marriage. Okay? Reality. Without the strength of the ox, you will not survive marriage. You will not. And then, and then you're not going to see the fullness of the fruitfulness that could take place. This is, this is, these, these are biblical words. And meaning no offence to those that have been through marriage, it's been difficult and, you, and it's, there's been a separation or whatever. Praise God, God redeems. Amen? Amen. Okay, and I love the scripture in Isaiah, he gives beauty for ashes. Yes, he does. You know what ashes means? It means the fire truck turned up too late. Yeah. 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 Mm. You know, God, where are you? You should have turned up like a year ago. What? <laughs> <laughs> Like, give beauty, the ashes is like smoldering ashes, finished, that's it. Finished, yeah. yeah. all over. Yeah. And then he comes in, gives beauty. Mm. So that's, that's part of the nature and character of God as well. Yeah. But, you know, um, this whole thing, the ox is, you, it speaks of endurance, which was a word that came out this morning. Did you notice that? <laughs> endurance, where you press in and you press through. It talks about long suffering. Oh, that's an amazing word. It means you have to suffer long. Yeah. Must be marriage. Then wait till you get kids. <laughs> then you learn a deeper level of sacrifice. Seriously. Especially in nighttime when you're not sleeping. The strength of the ox is speaking of yielded surrender to the master's will. A yielded surrender. Remember years ago, um, there's a great man of God. He's with the Lord now, but you can still go online. He's got teachings online. He's got books out there. Derek Prince. He is one of the great men of kingdom authority. He had a deliverance ministry. He's taught a lot on spiritual warfare. Derek Prince, very solid. And um, so Derek Prince had a whole thing about the Holy Spirit and our relationship with the Holy Spirit, a book, and it's basically 
Yieldedness and surrender. Mm. Yieldedness and surrender are the keys. And that's what, what has to yield, what has to, our, our fleshly wild bull nature has to be crucified. We have to make it a sacrifice. Then we need to yield and surrender our will to the Lord's will. And that's a key to, it says, to, to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Do not resist the Holy Spirit, Scripture says. Resisting is what the wild bull nature does. It resists the Spirit of God. It resists the conviction of God. And, and then what happens is the wild bull nature, it speaks, and then you call that voice God. You ever done that? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not the voice of God himself, mm -hmm. but you have your own will, and you do what you want, and say, God told me I can. Okay. And you can even have the dream to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a wild bull dream. Okay. Not every dream is from God. Right. Not every vision is from God. We've got to understand that. We've got to discern between these things. Right. Just like Jesus who separates the sheep from the goats. And the sheep are used for sacrifice as well. Okay. It's um, submission to authority. Mm. That's what the picture of the ox is all about. Can you imagine the strength of a lion that has not learned about submission to authority? Jesus is the great alpha of the lion pack, right? And when you are submitted to the great alpha and you are part of a lion-like company, at this time, God is calling not just eagle companies, that's the apostolic, sorry, the prophetic, the lion-like companies is the apostolic. He's calling four-faced companies. And true apostolic has the four faces. True apostolic is all of the different faces of God because apostolic represents Christ. Yeah. And you probably, if you picked up what I'm saying is, because everyone's really excited to be part of a prophetic company and we moved a lot as a prophetic company. God's speaking apostolic um, prophetically over our community the last couple of years. And apostolic is the fullness of Christ, not just the line. Okay. It speaks of, and this is another word that came out this morning about standing on the rock and being steadfast. And so um, Samuel released that word this morning. So come, if you don't turn up at 9.30 for the time of prayer, there's a lot of prophetic happening in the mornings that most of you miss out on. Um, we had a lot of confirmation of words, a lot of things I'm speaking about in my message. People are getting up with those words and sharing words this morning. God confirms. Okay, so steadfastness. Um, and so it's interesting. We yield to the Lord, but we will not yield to the enemy. That's the strength of an ox. It knows its master's voice, and it will press through, and it will not yield to the enemy's voice. Okay, there's a couple of words that are used for endurance, perseverance, uh, long-suffering in the Greek and so I want to give you some of the words with some of their meaning because this is going to give us word pictures of the character and the nature of the ox. Hupo mino. There you go. So hupo means to be under. Okay? Hupo mino means to bear under a heavy weight. A burden bearer. One that can carry a heavy weight without that heavy weight breaking you. To bear under means I'm able to carry a heavy weight. I can handle a lot, a weight of responsibility. This is why a lot of Christians don't see a great harvest in their lives. Okay? It's because they do not know how to bear the weight of responsibility. You know, and I remember as a young Christian missionary, you know, young, free and single and, and I used to, you know, wherever the Holy Spirit said go, I could go. And I'd be going off into the mountains of Tibet. And, and I did a lot of things for the kingdom. But I wasn't building or establishing anything for the kingdom. I was doing a lot of seed planting. That's what a lot of evangelists are like. They're like running around all over the place planting seed. By the way, you need to plant seed. Okay. God will use that in his process. But when you want to see something in and through your life established... And I had to go for a transition time, 
I had, the, I had the prophetic word over me that I was like this wild, unbroken horse. You know, you get those wild horses that are out there and they're just self-determined. They're running around the mountains doing whatever they want. And uh, the thing is that for that horse to be submitted to a rider, it has to be broken in. They actually have to break its will. That's what happens when you break a horse. You have to break its will. How about that? The, the oxen had to get castrated in order to break its will of self-determination. And so I had this prophetic word. It's, it's like, you know, you don't just hear it one time. You hear it several times. And then in Proverbs it says, The horse is ready for battle, but victory is in the Lord. And here's a horse. Yeah, because that's me. Like, I'm going to go and fight. I want to do evangelism. I'm going to take Tibet for Jesus. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to see the harvest and everything. Everyone wants harvest. They don't want the hard work. Yeah. Yeah. Harvest does not come without hard work. That's right. And it's where we're going to carry a weight of discipline. And, and sometimes your self will has to be broken That's it. so that you submit to the will of the Lord. And the Lord says, stay in this field, keep doing this work until I say stop. Yeah. Yes. And the Lord does have time to say, okay, now move on to a new field. Okay, there are seasons. And so the, the wild horse has to be broken. And, and that thing, yes, the victory is in the hands of the Lord. Here is the horse going, I want to go now. And I'm the sort of person, when God says go, I go. There's different personalities. Some people, you're, you're the, the other opposite personality. When God says go, you hear God say wait. You know, the forever waiting on the Lord people. It's like some of the prophetic people. Just wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord. And they never go. So when God says wait on the Lord, the wait on the Lord people hear that very quickly. When God says go, they don't hear it. So, could you do something about this? Would you finish what you've started? Oh, we're just going to wait. I need to wait on the Lord again. No, do it. Do what I want. No, I'm going to keep waiting. But I'm the different, I'm the different person. Now. I'm like, go, 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 go. And God says, stop. And I hear go. <laughs> when God says go, I hear go. That's a good bit. So we've all got different personalities. Yes. Okay. If you know yourself and you know your enemy, you'll have victory in warfare. That's it. Yeah. When I was in the Army Reserve, they told us the reason we lost Vietnam is that the Allied forces did not know their enemy. Yeah. They didn't know why they fought and what they were fighting for. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Know yourself. Know your enemy. And here's the thing. One of the great uh, advices or, or a, a principle of victory in spiritual warfare, ask yourself this question. If you were the devil, what would you do to defeat you? If you can get the answer to that question, I'll tell you what, you're going to be more than halfway to overcoming the enemy. Mm. If you are the devil, what have you done? What has the devil done to discourage you, defeat you, and cause you to give up in life? Mm. What has the devil done to cause you to pull back mm. from the work of the Lord? Mm. The ox is speaking about, I'm going to do the work of the Lord. I want to build the kingdom. Mm. Okay. So who you know to bear up under a heavy weight? So the picture of it is, is the oxen that would carry the heavy weight or, you know, um, someone like a weightlifter that's able to lift a heavy weight. Mm. It's also um, in the, the Greek Bible dictionary, it says to bear up courageously. Here's the strength of the ox. It bears up courageously. It doesn't lose heart. It doesn't get discouraged. It doesn't get overwhelmed with the responsibility or the burden, but it learns how to carry that burden and to fulfill the vision. That's why you need the, the eyes of the eagle, because otherwise if you lose the vision, my people perish for lack of vision. And so that's why the, you still need that as a source for vision. 
Here's another word very similar. Hupo. Are we learning Greek this morning? Hupo means? Cover. Under. Oh, under. Under. Hupo Firo is used to resist mm. the ability to, to come under without giving up testing, temptation, and tribulation. So it's translated as to resist the pressure that comes against you in life. That you don't give in to the pressure and get overwhelmed by the pressure. You know, again, you know, the eagle is going to, I'm going to escape to the high place again because I'll tell you what, it's going to be too difficult for me. And there isn't, God, a time to escape to the high place. Why? I've got to realign with the vision. I've got to remind myself and, and allow the Lord to remind me of the promises. There is that time to get into God's presence, but you ascend on the mountain of the Lord with your praise and your thanksgiving and your, your worship. You ascend on the mountain of the Lord, you encounter the Lord in the high place, and then you come down like the eagle yeah. sees its prey. Boom! Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then the eagle transforms into the ox because it, it's on a mission for God. Is on a mission for God. Mm. And just being in the high place alone, you'll never accomplish the mission of God unless from the high place you're very much engaged in intercession and prayer. That's a, that's a bit different. But even then, God will ask you to do stuff. So, but here is the resisting under temptation, the, the not giving up with the temptation to sin mm. or the temptation, you know, the devil comes on, lose heart, give up. The temptation to give in to hopelessness. Mm. And so the ox is enduring long. I will not give in to hopelessness. That's it. I will not give in to despair. Amen. I will not give in to worry. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press through this. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm. Here's another word. Macrothumio. These are all used in the Bible, okay? Macrothumio. Now, thumio, thermos, we have in English. Okay, the thermos is, it keeps your water hot, right? Mm -hmm. So, thumio has to do with hot heat. Okay? Macrothumio means to be able to be long tempered. Be angry, but do not sin. You just get angry in life. There's things that will make you angry. Okay? It's possible to be angry, but not sin. The anger of man does not lead to the righteousness of God, Scripture says. Mm. So what happens is the thumio, the fire of anger, rises up in you because you get angry at something. Yeah. But you're able to control that anger. Yeah. And more than control that anger, hear this. You channel it. You now turn anger into a friend Instead of allowing anger to be a destructive enemy. Instead of the wild bull that's just going to go out and just going to gore everything and destroy everything without building something. You now channel your anger and you sanctify it. Because the cutting off of the flesh, that's the process of sanctification. You make it holy unto the Lord. The word sanctify means that you, you no longer, it's no longer uh, it's common or ordinary like common ordinary people, common ordinary ways of reacting in life. You now separate it from what is common and ordinary unto God for his kingdom purpose. You get your anger and you focus it into a creative kingdom purpose way. Instead of me losing my temper and destroying people, I'm going to, I'm really angry. And so I'm going to now focus in the place of prayer and intercession and spiritual warfare and I'm going to in the powerful name of Jesus deal with the demonic powers that are stirring up problems in this situation right now I don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against yeah. powers and I'm going to now channel that anger think about that yeah. it's like the difference between a destructive flood that just ramages and rages through a countryside and you know all of the, the cattle and the sheep are getting killed and the great damage to property. That's what, um, uh, that's what intense emotions are like. It's not just anger, but fear, yeah. worry, anxiety. But it's like you keep it in a field. You dig a trench for it to be channeled yeah. 
in a kingdom way. So you channel your fear. You channel your, you know, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer, supplication, together with thanksgiving, make all your requests to God. What's that? Anxiety is an emotion that's exploding in your life and you could, you know, let it just take over you and you start to speak out negative words over yourself and over the people around about you and, and then all of that leads to often anger is something that comes out of your stress and you're worried, you say angry, hurtful things and oh, just, just you know, cursing, not blessing. Or instead of me speaking out all of that garbage and being like a destructive, unchanneled flood, I'm now going to channel it into prayer, mm -hmm. into intercession, yeah. together with thanksgiving. I don't feel like saying thank you at the moment, but thank you very much, Jesus, because you're going to turn this all around. Yes, yes. And I make my request known to God. And then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guards your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. See that picture? That's the strength of the ox. It's power and strength under control. Mm -hmm. It doesn't lash out, mm -hmm. but it focuses it and it redeems mm -hmm. it. And then, you know, you use that, you know, you cast your burdens on the Lord. Well, you, you can't cast your burdens on the Lord if you never get burdened. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So then God will allow situations to happen that you get burdened. <laughs> okay? And by the way, anxiety that is redeemed is no longer a curse, it's a blessing. Mm. And some of you who are more naturally warriors, because some people, they look at the world, they look at life, and they look at what's going on in the world stage with the news, and you get worried. You get anxious. You get burdened. Some people more than others because they're very sensitive. Mm. Okay, well, you people that are very sensitive warriors have the potential to be the most powerful warriors. Mm. <laughs> You're burdened about things more than others. You're seeing, you know, concerning issues more than others. Mm. You're tuned into that, but now you redeem it. <coughs> Instead of allowing that, that weight to crush you, you learn how to lift it to the Lord. And this is what yoking's about. Oxen get yoked. We're going to look at this in a future lesson about what it means to be yoked to the Lord. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Because it's easy. It's light. <laughs> to take Jesus' yoke upon you, understand this. To yoke an oxen, you get two of them together. Mm. And to take Jesus' yoke upon you means Jesus is yoked to you. And you are yoked to Jesus, and together with Jesus, one with him, one yoke, you're plowing the field. And I'll tell you what, Jesus never gets defeated. Yeah. Jesus yeah. always finishes what he starts. But you've got to learn about yoking. Mm. And that's a, a future lesson. I'm just kind of introducing all sorts of things. Maybe, maybe this morning should be introduction to the face of the ox. <laughs> but you know the power of that? When you try to do it yourself, and by the way, here is a prophetic promise of the Lord. You can't do it. There you go. How's that? Run around with that one in your promise box. And I'm quoting Romans chapter 10. It says, faith says, I can't. How's that? Faith says, I cannot ascend to heaven and bring Christ down. And I cannot descend into hell and bring him up. I can't. But salvation is near every one of us. Yeah. It's in our heart. It's in our mouth. Because it's the Word of God. Faith comes from agreeing with the Word of God. I can't, says faith. But Christ can. Yeah. And Christ can in me and through me if I learn how to yoke with Him. And sometimes I tell people, well, how do you do that? You know, like, I'll tell you what, this is how I do it. It's like, I can't do it, Lord. Yes. I need your help. Mm. And I even say this sometimes in prayer. I yoke myself together with you. Mm. Lord, help me bear and carry this burden. Amen. Lord, I give this burden to you. 
And he says, okay, take my yoke upon you. So this is a very important thing of how we can work through these situations. Here is a Wikipedia dictionary meaning for patience and perseverance. To remain firm in your commitment, to remain true to it, despite all suffering and adversity. To remain firm and true in your commitments, despite suffering and adversity. So here is my kind of Christian amplified version. <laughs> to remain firm and true in your covenant commitments to the Lord and his kingdom purpose, despite sufferings, temptations, oppositions, hardship, adversity and trial. Mm. Yeah. So when the Bible says endurance, the endurance of the ox, patience, perseverance, long-suffering, mm. that we remain firm and true to our covenant commitments before the Lord, despite whatever opposition, adversity or testing is coming against us. That is Christ-like. And God is like that. Can you imagine if God would just lash out like a wild bull from heaven every time we sin? Well, this whole room would be full of like, you know, burnt toast looking people. He's long suffering. He's patient. Because he's full of, you know, the, the, the compassion and the mercy over us. By the way, um, the character of the ox is also seen, and this is another word that was brought out this morning. Faithfulness. Yeah, same that came out this morning. Someone had that word when we were seeking the Lord for just words. Faithfulness. Did you know that the Greek word for faithfulness is the same Greek word for faith? Mm -hmm. Lord, increase my faith. Okay, well I'm going to give you adversity and opposition and here's another demon to attack you and you're going to learn how to endure and be faithful through tests. That's it. And as you learn how to be faithful in the testing times, your faith increases. Because you learn how faithful God is to his promises. Faithfulness. He is faithful. We read that out of Habakkuk this morning. Even though the word might seem to tarry, write it down so you can run with it. And even though it seems to tarry, the Lord will come. The Lord will fulfill it. In the Lord's time. Why doesn't God just answer our prayers, you know, really fast? I want the microwave prayer, you know. There it is. You know, I want to go to the McDonald's Christianity Church. If, if all you ever do is eat Big Macs and fries or eat pizza, you'll have a face that looks like it. <laughs> McDonald's Christianity there's so much that's in the church today that the spirit of the world is all about fast food yeah. that's it. it's easy access it's about shortcuts that's it. but the endurance of the, God intentionally on purpose says in order for me to increase your faith to make you more Christ like in your character and your nature I intentionally will not answer your prayer quickly. Now, there are some emergency prayers that God does answer quickly because it's needed. Amen? But can you, can you know, if, if his answer is tarrying and, the prayer, and you need a breakthrough and it's tarrying and you're in the middle of the valley of the shadow of testing, which is also called the valley of the shadow of death. So you choose life or death in that valley. Okay? Because I am with you, says the Lord. In the middle of the valley of the shadow of testing and death, I am with you. So I'll fear no evil. So what happens is God intentionally holds back. And so when you say, God, why aren't you answering? Here is your answer. Are you ready? Because God is trying to develop your faith. He's trying to develop your character. He doesn't want, you know, those selfish kids that went, eh, hey, mom, dad, eh. Hey throw tantrums and then mum and dad you know give in to them straight away so they grow up as a very selfish and spoiled brat yes. Yes. 
And then when they get married, heaven help their spouse. Because they've learned how to manipulate and control people through tantrums and anger and manipulation. And that's, that's the wild bull, people. That is not Jesus. That is an anti-Christ attitude. And so the Lord disciplines those he loves. That's it. Hebrews 12. That's it. Because he loves you too much to ruin you. That's it. Parents that really love their children will discipline them. Amen. They will not give them, you know, every time they want McDonald's instead of veggies, they will not give them McDonald's every time. Just sometimes to reward them. Mm -hmm. Okay? But not every time. And sometimes even Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to throw that in there. <clears throat> Very quickly, I want to finish uh, with this. Let's look at First Thessalonians chapter one. First Thessalonians chapter one. I did share this on the Wednesday night, but the Lord impressed on me. I need to share it with the whole church. First Thessalonians chapter one. <clears throat> Starting with verse 1 and 2. Sorry, sorry, 2 and 3. Now we give thanks to God always for each one of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers to God. Why? Here's the Apostle Paul. He's talking, he says, myself and the apostles and the apostolic teams that we work with, whenever we think about you Thessalonian Christians and we're talking about you, you have a testimony that brings great joy to our hearts, so we are thanking God constantly for you. And this is the reason why they were praying that prayer. Because remember you before God, our God and Father. Why? Because you do the work of faith, the labor of love, and you have steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. These are all ox like attributes. The labor of love. Remember the word love, agape? Yes. Agape is not an emotional, feely wheely sort of love. You know, mm. I love you today, I don't love you tomorrow. Agape is a covenant commitment type love. Yeah. It is a commitment to follow through. That's what you need agape in marriage because there's days that you look at your spouse and think, I really love you. Other days you look at them and you think the, the opposite. <laughs> you feel the opposite? <laughs> Seriously. And agape, it's like my, my wife says, Do you love me today? I said, I agape you. Because <laughs> <laughs> agape is not emotional. A filio is. It's another word used in the Bible for love. Agape is a covenant commitment. It's based in the Hebrew hased. When they translated the Hebrew Old Testament to Greek, Hased is translated agape. Hased is covenant faithfulness. Okay? I'm in covenant, so I will be faithful. That's a ox like attribute. That's it. No matter what I feel today, I'm in covenant with God. I will not follow my feelings. I will not obey my feelings. I will obey the Lord, and He's commanded me to covenant love Him, to covenant love my spouse, to covenant love these other people in the church. To covenant love even my enemies. Love your enemies. Yeah. And so I'm going to walk in this love because of covenant. I'm going to endure the hardship, the testing, the trial in this relationship. The labor of love. Wow, oh, we're praising God constantly for you because the, you've understood the key of the kingdom, which is called the labor of love. And, and your and your, and your labor in relationships where you endure and you press through and you don't give up is motivated by the love of God because God is agape. God is covenant faithfulness. The second one is um, oh sorry, the work the work of faith is the next one. That's first in the list. So works that come out of faith, and faith comes from what? Hearing God's voice 
hearing God has spoken, and so I will do what he says. Amen. So it's interesting. There's works of faith. It's not just, oh, I feel. Yeah, that's it. You know, here is, here is the greatest faith. When you feel like you don't love the Lord, you feel he's not faithful. You feel doubt and unbelief, but you obey what you know is said anyway. Yeah, that's that's faith. Faith is not feeling. Mm. I tell you what, most Christians, you know how there's days that you really, oh, I really love the Lord, I can really trust and believe in Him today, I really believe the promises are coming. You know, you have those, they're good days, by the way. Mm. But that's when your emotions are in agreement. Yeah. But the greater faith is when your emotions are going, I don't think God's going to break through, where is God, I doubt the Lord, I don't think He's faithful, in fact, I'm pretty cheesed off with the Lord at the moment. <laughs> But I'm not going to listen to my feelings. Why feelings lie? Yes, yes. And the word of God never does. There's a truth that is higher than your emotions yeah. or your experience. That's it. Most people think testimony comes from experience. The most powerful testimony comes from the word of God. Yes. Amen. And then finally, the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and I love the way the NIV words this. The NIV says, endurance, that's inspired by hope. That's the, the eagle that's in the heavenly high places and it's hearing the voice of God and it's got the heavenly vision. And the eagle sees, faith sees and declares what will be as if it already is. That's faith. I walk by faith and not by sight because what I see is a lie when it is opposite to the promise of God. Now you catch that one. There's a reality of what's of what I can see, yes. But when God has promised such and such will happen and the opposite is taking place, I need to see by faith the fulfilment of God's promise and not focus with my eyes on what is happening right now. Mm -hmm. Our testimonies are often based off what we see and feel and hear in the natural and then we get the Antichrist testimony. You know, the prayer doesn't work. You know, evangelism doesn't work. Did that for, you know, three years. It didn't work. Okay, well, sometimes the difference is in attitude. Faith yeah. declares what will be as if it already is. Yeah. And that's, you need hope for that. Yeah, that's right. Hebrews 11, you know, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Being certain of things unseen. Yes. Now, that eagle-like characteristic inspires the ox-like endurance. Because can you imagine, have you ever been in like the drudgery of the hard work? And God has given you promises, but the promises to be fulfilled, it's a lot of hard work. And you're in this eat, work, sleep, eat, work, sleep, eat, work, sleep, and you're not seeing the harvest. You're not seeing the breakthroughs. It's work, 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 work. That's when you need to be inspired by the vision of hope. Yes. That's when you need to... I need to pull back and get into the presence of God. That's when I need to pull back from the work and get into the, the presence of God. Then I get inspired. I see the joy set before me so I can endure my cross. I see uh, God's promise fulfilled. And then I go, now I know why I'm in the field. I see by faith the harvest that's coming, so I'm going to do all the hard work that's required to bring in the harvest. Yeah. Okay. Scripture speaks a lot about hope, and it says, you don't hope, Romans 8, you don't hope for what you already have. Now, could you imagine me walking around the church this morning going, I'm, I'm hoping in the Lord for a, a wife. You'd look at me like, you've got a wife. I don't have to hope for a wife. I've got a, I've got a wife. So hope is there for the things we don't yet have. Yeah. It's there for the promises that are not yet fulfilled. And in Romans 8, the context is that for this hope we are saved, the redemption of our body. That's when we are perfected, body, soul, and spirit. Perfected and fully like Christ. I'm not there yet. Ask my wife. <laughs> she reminds me. <laughs> She's not there yet either. <laughs> but, but the thing is, 
There is a hope of our perfection. And the hope in the fullness of becoming like Christ, the fullness of our faith being perfected, the harvest come. that hope inspires me that I'm going to endure through this valley of testing. So that's what I wanted to share this morning. So Heavenly Father, I just lift up each one before you this morning and I ask, Lord, that you release over them the grace of the ox. And, and much of this, Lord, long-suffering and faithfulness and endurance, this is fruit of the Spirit. Yes. So I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be working in each one of our lives the fruit of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, that you would come and give us this endurance, that you give us this faithfulness, this ability to, to press on and press through hardship. Lord, the, the ability to do the hard work until the promise is revealed. We ask that you would give us the eyes of the eagle, yes. that we'd see heaven's vision, yes. that we'd see by faith, Lord, just give us the eyes of faith this morning, that we would see what will be as if it already is, so that we can declare over our life, over our marriage, over our children, over our circumstance, what will be as if it already is. Amen. And even though we're seeing an opposite of the promises manifest, we will continue to declare, when we see the dry dead bones, I see a mighty army. When I see a dry, dead spiritual Christian, I see in them the potential of a mighty warrior. When I look at myself in the mirror, I see the fullness of Christ by faith. Amen. Until it comes, keep us on that track. Amen. Keep us Amen. in that field, O oh Lord, I pray, Amen. that we would not wander in disillusionment into the ways of the world, hanging out with the people of the world that would lead us into activities that would be in the opposite direction of Christ's likeness. And Lord, I would thank you that not only do we yoke ourselves with Christ, but we are yoked to a spiritual company. You don't leave us orphans, but you bring us into the family of God. Amen. In Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen.